Good afternoon and welcome. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce two wonderful dentists in our practice, the IOMT, Dr. Joe Palmer. He's been a practicing dentist in Greenville, South Carolina since graduating from the Medical University of South Carolina School of Dentistry in 1982. His office incorporates the latest technology with the most biocompatible materials available and removes mercury fillings using protocols established by the IAOMT. He is also one of the very first dentists in the United States to incorporate CEREC, computer-generated one-visit porcelain procedures, into his practice. Dr. Palmer has been a, me a member since 2001 and has received his fellowship. Dr. Matthew Young is a biologic general dentist in Henderson Hendersonville, North Carolina. He got his bachelor's degree of science from Davidson College in 1979 and his DDS degree from Indiana University School of Dentistry in 1983. He is a past president, fellow of the academy, and currently on the IOMT Board of Directors. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the purpose of our talk is, like I said earlier, is to be an extension of the fundamentals course to give new members a little bit more background of relatedness in order to make the transition from a regular allopathic dental office to a biologic dental practice. And so just briefly, uh, as a summary of what is a biologic dental practice, we want to provide barrier protection for patients and team members when removing mercury, amalgam fillings, provide biologic support for our patients in order to give them the supplementation, the knowledge it takes to uh, remove it from their body. Um, we also have some type of biological approach when treating periodontal disease using lasers, iodine, iod uh, and ozone. We also try and stay as metal free as possible. There are some exceptions to that rule, of course, if you're doing a very large span bridge that won't take a zirconia foundation or a lower partial, there's not enough room. Uh, zirconia bridges, implants, porcelain inlays, onlays, and crowns. And we want to protect the environment from toxic waste using mercury separators and other uh, methods of disposing of our waste. I've, uh, I've kind of gone the full metal free route. I don't do any restorations with metal anymore. Um, I just left a seminar a couple weeks ago and saw full mouth roundhouse bridges out of zirconium bridges, so I know they can be done. I don't you have to do those, but um, I've just totally gone away from metal. So I would, do, I would do a long span zirconium bridge in place of metal supported bridges now. Okay, well, these were just some of the essential tools that we wrote down a little while ago, and I know I've been a CIRAC user for about seven years, and Joe's one of the first trainers, so he has a lot more experience with that than I do. Um, we just took up ozone in our office a couple months ago, and I tell you the truth, the ozone machine in my office now stays on all the time. If we're not using it to treat patients, we're making ozonated water to use as mouthwash. Uh, we use it in our Cavitron machines now, in our dental units to reduce the biofilm. Uh, there's probably at least 20 or 30 uses of ozone. We could just spend a whole hour on that if you wanted to, but I'd consider it an essential tool. Um, I used to have the idea that I was, would buy these little $99 Japanese hand pieces, and when they broke, I would just throw them away. Well, you have to quit doing that when you're doing biology dentistry because your CIRAC and your crown of bridge is not going to look nearly as good with a cheap hand piece as it will with a really nice, well-balanced hand piece. So, if you don't buy the top of the line air driven hand pieces at least, invest in a nice electric hand piece with some really uh, nice attachments so you get much better margins, a lot less chatter with your burrs. Um, I got my comb beam machine about seven or eight years ago. I know Joe's had his for a while. You will be amazed if you get a comb beam how many lateral abscesses you see between the roots, especially on a maxillary molar. And I pull a lot of root canal teeth and clean them out now and put the ozone in the extraction sites. So without a comb beam, I don't even think I could practice dentistry anymore. And if you're placing implants, it's almost essential. It's become the standard of care. Also, I try and do at least one training session with my staff every week during our morning meetings, and we'll start our morning meetings about a half an hour early that day. And for the last, for the last month and a half, we've been doing ozone. So we go back to the ozone machine. We train everybody how to turn the machine on, how to turn the machine off. Unfortunately, we put the uh, olive oil right directly next to the machine and sucked up some olive oil in the machine by accident. So within a month, I learned my lesson um, to use it properly. So make sure your staff is very well trained. Make sure they're all on the bus and make sure that, the, especially the hygienist, 
can educate your patients about all these different alternative therapies that you're going to see. And then the most essential thing I think about being a biologic dentist is to be able to think outside the box. I know I send my kids home with a prescription for super saturated potassium iodine and it comes from the factory 50 milligrams per drop and so we dilute that 50% and have the kids brush with two drops twice a week and we do that instead of fluoride. And I went up to um, the Earth Fair in Asheville a couple years ago and did a talk to the homeschool parents during a seminar up there and told them I was fluoride free and the phone rang off the hook the next, the next couple of weeks. So that's something for you to, to bear in mind too. Used to be, again, when we were in dental school, we would learn the different forms of pathology and what to be mindful of. Um, and so we have to start to think in terms of not just infection and pain, but look around the margins of all these old PFM crowns on your patients when they come in. If the tissue is green or purplish in color, it probably has a nickel metal underneath the PFM. And so we document those crowns with a lot of uh, detail and tell them, you know, if you want to get rid of this reaction that you're having to these old materials, you're going to have to replace it with ceramic. So you have to think in terms of thinking outside the box. And then the most important one is how about you and your staff and their exposure to mercury. So that's one reason why we did this research project that we're going to talk about in just a moment. This is a, a new study that's just been published by Janet Kern. Janet is a PhD. She works with the Geyers. Uh, I don't know if they spoke this morning, but they, they will be speaking at the conference. The Geyers are uh, David and Mark have been instrumental in the vaccine exposures, what's going on in our vaccines. Um, great research, and you'll hear them talk. This was done in the neuroendocrinology letter, uh, just came out. And basically what Janet did was a scientific review um, to evidence to examine the relationship between mercury exposure from dental amalgams and certain idiopathic chronic illnesses. And your patients are going to come in and be talking about these kind of diseases and symptoms that go with these diseases. They've been to the medical route and they've been labeled with maybe fibromyalgia, which isn't fibromyalgia, it's heavy metal toxicity. But it will mimic those same kind of symptoms. That happened to my wife. It's how I found out about all this. Um, but so you'll hear chronic fatigue will be a major thing your patients will complain about. Fibromyalgia, they've been told they've had fibromyalgia, which is just a catch-all for everything hurts. They'll be depressed, they'll be anxious, some may be suicidal. You may think they're crazy people, but they're not. They're sick people. Um, they found dental amalgams commonly used as a restorative material, and of course you know it contains 50% mercury. The vapors cause problems. She shows through studies that show that the chronic mercury exposure um, is associated with numerous health complaints. Fatigue, anxiety, depression, these are among the main symptoms that are associated with CFS and FM. In addition, several studies have shown the removal of amalgams is associated with improvement in these symptoms. And of course, we all know that all this is still under the bait, but when you hear people lecture here, and you hear other dentist stories that are here who've been sick and gotten better, you realize that this is a major, major problem in many people's health conditions. And it can be a major problem for you. I had mercury poison and had to be treated, if you know my whole story. My heart's been damaged by mercury. Um, you know, I practiced 15 years before I knew about this problem. And so thank you for the IOMT for getting me to the point um, that I started to take care, care of myself, that I got treated and got better, and I started to protect myself, my team members, and my patients when we're dealing with this highly toxic stub substance. And it should be so easy to transition to this type of practice, because the only thing that's a barrier to that is mason between your ears. It's fear. You're scared of the board. You're scared what your colleagues will say. You're even real worried about your patients, and they're the least of your worries. You're not sure what it's going to cost, but it's not as much as what you would think. It's really a very inexpensive way to change the way you do dentistry. Is there some risks there? If you're a, an associate, 
I'm thinking, that goes in with an older doctor who's only doing mercury and still making you do it, I know you have to kind of do that in that practice. So what are you going to do? Lose your job? Change your, or change your doctor? Or say, I would like to do it differently. Can I? Have the conversation. But if you keep doing it and exposing yourself, you're running a huge risk of your own health. There's an overwhelming mix of information in the fundamentals course in this symposium we're having this weekend. It can be a lot of info. We're here to help you. The older guys, the mentors, this is the most giving organization you'll ever be in. All you got to do is ask for somebody to call and you will have somebody willing to help you and guide you uh, as you make yourself a more biological practice. And it takes time. You know, you get back to work and you got to work. You're producing dentistry. And there's not a lot of time to do a lot of things. We have made it easy for you. Well, there's a vendor list. The front office can help you find these people. Or go through the accreditation process. You will gain even more knowledge and more insight into those vendors. Now, what do we do about the boards? Because the dental boards don't like us. They don't like people who tell the truth. They're different from every dentist out there, and we are different. Well, don't antagonize them by creating a marketing environment that's, that says things that they can challenge you on. You can be truthful and you can market, but you should do it uh, in the proper way. Use the term barrier protection for amalgam removal rather than safe mercury removal. And we've just changed our advertising to say this, and I think on my website, we're starting to use barrier protection. Patients know what that means. And it's just true, it's what you do. It's not saying you're safe, safer, better than the other guy, it's just stating what you do as a procedure. They shouldn't be able to touch you for that. Don't worry about your colleagues who aren't doing this. They're the ones that will complain to the board, but don't worry about what they think about you. I'm just an old southern redneck from South Carolina, and I can tell you less. When I bought, when I bought one of the first Cerec machines, everybody in town was talking about me. I didn't care. When you're leading the pack, when you're a little different, just get a big old target on your back, let them shoot arrows in it, it's not going to hurt a bit. Because they're going to be behind you, not in front of you. And their patients will be coming to you. That's right. <laughs> now, the patients are your least worried because the only thing a patient has ever said to me is thank you. When I first started doing this, um, you know, I, I came in, had a patient we were going to do some mercury on. They had no idea there was mercury in these fillings. I hadn't told them. And I just said simply, you know what? I'm recovering from mercury poisoning. And I have finally learned how to protect myself and you. I'm going to have this mask on that looks like Darth Vader. And I would like to put the rubber, I call it the dam. I just I'd like to put a barrier in your mouth to keep you from breathing these particles of mercury. And I'd like you to breathe some oxygen through your nose so you don't breathe the room air we create, contaminate as we do this. And they look at me and go, thank you. No problem. Now that's when it started. Now, I don't have to do that procedure because now patients come to me, they walk in the door and say, I want my mercury out safely. And they already know we're supposed to be doing all of that. I wear uh, a lot more barrier protection now. I'm the guy in the space suit. And it scares people. No, it doesn't scare anybody. Sometimes I will forget to put the hood up. And the patient will be there all covered up, their hands will be under the wrap, and all of a sudden they'll look at me and start, I see their eyes go kind of funny and their hands will start moving and I'm looking around going, what the hell, what the, how am I hurting them? They'll start pointing, I go, oh crap, I hadn't put my hood up. <laughs> they're worried about me too. So there is no problem with these patients. You will have an occasional claustrophobic patient. You may have to use some sedation on or really help them get through the five or six minutes it's going to take to get that mercury out. Very, very rare. Very rare. So that, that, any excuse for that is only between the dentist ears, okay? 
Now, time. It takes a little more time and you have a little more cost charge for that time. Manny and I both charge a mercury protection fee. I charge $175, you charge $345. $345. They just pay it. They don't complain, they just write the check. Right? I don't think I've ever had a patient complain about that. As a matter of fact, they thank me for charging them for it. And another thing, getting back to Joe, that he mentioned is that you have to, every time you add another layer of protection, you have to use the words benefit. The benefit of using the rubber dam is you're not swallowing it. The benefit of using the oxygen is you're not breathing it. The benefit to my employee for wearing this Tyvek gown is she's not getting it on her skin, taking it home to her family. So just use the word benefit or acronym for that every time you add these barriers. And patients are more than willing to travel across the state and write you a check for that. And, it, and your extra time does have to be charged for it. That also starts back at the front desk person who's answering the phone. Your front desk person has to have some screening questions to ask them. And the longer that patient goes on and on and on about their history, you know you're going to have to charge more for your time for that patient. So we can separate patients by A, B, C, or D, depending upon how much time we know they're going to take. You're going to have some equipment cost. Uh, you're going to need a high volume air filtration. The two that we usually see at the shows are the Den Air Vac and the IQ Air. Price range from about 1000 to I think 2500 for the mm -hmm. IQ Air. You, you and your assistant should have a respirator mask. There's two types of those that we recommend. There's a Comfo Fit, which we'll have it, they should have them out here at the uh, IMT booth. Covers your nose and your mouth and you can wear loops with it. There's also a full face mask that you'll see Maddie and I have on when we show some slides that I just think is more comfortable, but you cannot wear loops with it. You can wear eye protection. Both of them are fine, whichever one you'd like to have. They run around $450. The disposable barriers or some maybe could use washable barriers if you like. I wouldn't want to be washing clothes all day at a dental office, but uh, or make my team do that, but some people do. Probably about $50 in cost, and I'm telling you that's really a little high. The number I have there. Your air source for your patient could be a number of things. It could be your nitrous cart and just use an oxygen tank. It could be a scuba tank with air in it rigged up with a nasal mask. There's all kind of ways to do it. We'll show you a couple of examples of that. So it just depends on what you have cost there. And I, I put bear protection in there twice and didn't catch that. Same thing. <clears throat> All right, so if okay. Dr. Wazinski washes his surgical, his drapes. Now for himself, I don't know about his patients, but his team, they have them, they just wash them. He measured uh, with a Jerome Mercury analyzer. He measured his dryer after he cleaned everything and he measured them, the garments themselves. He, he didn't pick up anything. So he is, and now he didn't mention any special detergent. So it'll wash off and go out through the drain water. And uh, so that, that's one way to keep them clean. But now, if there's a load sitting in there, three or four of them, and you open the door, you're going to have some mercury vapor coming out. So if I were doing laundry of that dirty stuff, I would have a vapor mask on. Okay. Also, when you change the traps in your, in your chairs, make sure you wear your mask too. Right. Uh, but that's the whole idea behind wearing another disposable gown over the top of your scrubs, so that everything that's contaminated with particulate, you bundle it up, and Joe will show you. Uh, later on how they how you prevent that if you keep it off your scrub to begin with it doesn't get in your washing machine So in your marketing if you're going to do any marketing learn how to educate without getting negative attention from other colleagues 
Don't claim safer, better, I'm different. Just talk about providing protection rather than, again, in the safe mercury, and make no claim of superior performance. Internal is better than external. We run uh, contests, quarterly contests, where we ask patients for referrals, and the prize, one time it was a TV, this time it's a vacation weekend, um, up at the Grove Park Inn, a couple of bottles of wine, a year-long pass, those kind of things. And patients get to, when they refer, they get put in a drawing. Or if they write us a review, they get put in a drawing. And we do that quarterly. Very inexpensive way to make internal marketing really, really work. Um, we get, um, we average 80 new patients a month with some of the stuff we're doing. We're trying to push it up to over 100. Um, like Maddie said, go to the holistic groceries and co-ops, like-minded providers, the naturopaths, the integrative health physicians, friendly publications like Natural Awakenings, uh, which that type patient, holistic patient, picks this magazine up and reads it all the time. Another thing, too, I might add is if you live uh close to any larger cities than where you're practicing, one good thing I've suggested to new members is to pick up a yellow page book from as many big towns within say a 20 or 30 mile radius of your practice and load the naturopaths, homeopaths, chiropractors, anybody that might refer you as a professional and as a patient into your system. And then you can designate doctor as a salutation and then at least with EagleSoft, the program that I work with, you can set up an email system. You can call, hey, what's your email? Or set it up as a letter and say, I'm Dr. Jones. I'm the new biology dentist in this area. I want to help detoxify your patients and work with them to improve their health. Boom. You can print out 100 letters and get them out. And you'll start getting referrals from those people, too. Uh, this, is a, this is an ad we run in uh, Natural Awakening. But there's one thing wrong with this ad. Um, this was, this, I didn't get the corrected copy. Uh, this says safe mercury removal. I don't let them say that in our ads anymore. I say that we provide barrier protection during mercury filling removal. And I do call them mercury fillings. Um, just, you know, just pretty good little, this ad generates about, uh, last, last week we got eight calls off that ad. That's in one week. Um, I'll tell you how we know that in just a few minutes. Now, people who have been very important in growing my practice over the last couple of years, and I, I just want to tell you, I'm not going to tell you how much I do. I want to tell you I'm a very successful dentist. I have a very nice income. I love my lifestyle. It's nice. My practice grew by $600,000 last year. And this man helped me grow that practice. And my range down here in the front, he owns a uh, company called Equa, and they manage my website now. And he, you know, I don't understand any of that stuff. I couldn't tell you how to get on Facebook, but everything I have a Facebook account. And I think I even got a Twitter account. I've never even know. I can't even open Twitter. <laughs> and I got more Twitter followers than I think I do Facebook followers. And he also provides me with call tracking. Now, call tracking is any other advertising I've done, any, any marketing piece. Noreen will assign a phone number to that, which that phone number then goes to my office phone number. But he can tell me. I, I just I get an email. Guess what your website, how many calls you had on your website last week? From your website. We had 108 calls last week. Now, that was not 108 new patients. Because what your patients do these days is they go to their smartphone, they click on your website, and they hit call. But we can also figure out how many of those were new callers. He can tell me. It's incredible. I just look and say, hey, if it's getting 108 calls, some of them are going to be new patients. And I got a girl that does the rest of that for me. I don't do it. I highly recommend Equa and Noreen to help grow your practice. And I think he only takes one per geographical area. Is that right? Okay. 
Um, we have other vendors here to talk to. Talk International has done a good job. I'm not going to slight those people that come and help us too. I have used more consultants than most dentists probably. I've always had some type of consultants in there and I can name the big ones. Um, one of them's here I haven't used, which is I think Dr. Schuster's here. I don't know him, haven't met him. I don't know if he's in the room, but I have not used him. I've had great results with some. I've had lousy results with some. I bet everybody in this room has got a marketing piece from Jay Geyer Scheduling Institute, which I threw him away for years. I actually heard Jay 10 years ago at a marketing conference and bought his little, well, I guess it was 10, I bought cassette tapes at the time, that's how old, how old it was, on how to answer the phone. We thought we knew better than Jay did. We listened to it and threw it away. So I recently brought in a, an associate, a young kid out of school, came to me, wanted to work for me. I corrupted him before he went to school so he couldn't go to work for another dentist because he knew he'd get poisoned. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm not really ready, but come on, we'll see what we do. So I looked around and tried to say, I better, I want some help this time to do this right. And I ended up going with Jay Geyer. I got started with his telephone training. His telephone answering training is amazing. I didn't believe it could make a big difference. We were averaging 30 patients, new patients a month. We didn't do any different marketing. We weren't doing any direct mail pieces at the time. And by answering the phone differently, we started getting 60 new patients a month. Actually, I think it was 65. That's incredible how many times we were screwing up the telephone call. If you just got that information from him, I'm telling you to change your practice, it will make it grow. I just highly recommend him. I don't get any kickbacks. You can tell him I recommended you. If 20 of you went in there, he might give me a dinner or something. I don't know. <laughs> great guy. It's a great Christian organization, I'll tell you that. Jay's purpose to make money these days because he doesn't need any is so he can give it back. And he just encourages your doctors to, if you want to increase your income, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It just helps you have a bigger impact on other people. So I highly recommend them. All right, Manny. Okay. So a lot of this could be very overwhelming. We realize that. So that's why we're here to help and give you as much information to take back to your practice on Monday as you can. Um, all of our facts are based on either published or soon to be published science, and you can't hide the facts. Uh, we're here today to show you how to be healthier and work safer and hopefully to live a, a long, happy life. And Joe's already told you his story about his heart attack when he was in his 40s. So something to keep in mind is 25% of everybody who's walking on the planet has an impaired ability to excrete mercury. And this is where a lot of the sickness from, your, from yourself or your patients are coming from. It's really important to get signed up with the mentor program. I know I've mentored several new IMT members over the last few years, and I'm glad to either have them call me on my cell phone personally or email me with questions. That's no problem. So make sure you get up with uh, Mark Ber Berkowitz this weekend and get yourself signed up for a mentor. What's the consequence of ignoring the science? This was uh, Dr. Uh, Tom Duplinski and Dr. Cicchetti's study done back in 2012. They uh, compared 700 dentists versus about a thousand controls and they found out that uh, dentists had a seven half to seven point six times higher neurological impairment two and a half times higher psychiatric problem uh, almost double the cardiovascular issues and respiratory problems one thing that uh, this slide doesn't show was uh, tom told me this story while he was working at yale university the medical school the Patterson representative came in one day and knocked on his door and said, Tom, what's up with all these dentists dying of brain cancer? And he said, what do you mean? I'm doing this study, but we haven't focused on that yet. He said they're, they're getting these uh, geoblastomas in the brain, which is very rare. And I think he knew six of them that were six and f sick and four of them had already died. So Tom sent out a researcher to those dental offices and guess what they found? All six of those dentists had shag carpet in their operatories. So what that means is all that particulate had been falling in the operatories all those years and years and they were sitting there breathing it. So as you'll find out here pretty soon, the particulate's just as dangerous if not more than the vapor. These are some other studies. Um, 
done, which shows an increase in cardiovascular disease at Vanderbilt, uh, Hearst, Clarkston, Goldsmith. Find out that the uh, vapor and the particulate goes right through your skin. It's just like putting a nitroglycerin patch on your skin. So it goes directly through the uh, epidermis. Journal part prosthetic dentistry showed the particulate inhalation during amalgam removal with NEMO. Uh, it was a very important study. The particulate up to seven micrometers can go directly into the alveolus of the lungs and then directly into the bloodstream. Um, this also shows um, with this study on the inhaled dust with the particulate hopping into the bloodstream, like I said, the heart receives an extremely high level of mercury. And what the mercury does in the mitochondria of the heart, there's a 15,000 times higher potential gradient for the mercury to enter the mitochondria. Then instead of making ATP, it makes what's called hydroxy-free radicals, which destroys the heart's ability to produce energy. The brain and the liver has highest, uh, higher levels and so do the kidneys. So remember from Joe's study that he shows during the uh, fundamentals um, that this is a very toxic substance indeed. This was the study that Joe and I worked on together. Basically, we decided we were going to figure out with the particulate and the vapor together what was the, going to be the total dosage for dentists. And so we took a mannequin head with 100 mercury amalgams and we removed eight amalgams at a time, four on the left and four on the right. They were all exactly a uh, triple spill. We did six sessions. Um, with all the, engineering, all the engineering controls turned on, and then as we did each session, we turned one of those controls off to make it a little bit more contaminated. By the time we were done, we were, dry, we were drilling high and dry. What we found out with all the controls all on, we had actually three different methods of measuring. We had one measurement that took the particulate and the vapor together. That was a small carbon filter that sat right here on our chest, and it sucked in air like an aquarium pump. And so it measured the particulate and the vapor together. Then we measured the, just the particulate by itself, and then we measured the, the vapor with the atomic absorption spectrophotometer. And so this shows, with all the controls on, there was a significant difference between all the controls on and just with the water and the suction. With the vapor, the peak level was 1.3 with everything turned on. 21.4 from a traditional dentist when you're just having the suction in the water. Then the average of the total vapor was much, was much lower with all the controls turned on compared to with them turned off. And then the highest particulate was always higher at the very bottom of the, of the graph. And just to keep this in mind, I don't know if everybody remembers what the OSHA limits are, your assistants and your hygienist can only breathe 50 micrograms in a day. And on a single exposure, they can't breathe more than 100. So as you can see, pretty much all the levels were over that OSHA limit. The, the particulate samples were surface samples. We right. did wipe samples. So it was, took it from the chest, assistant's knee, down to the knee of the patient, the abdomen. Those kind of areas were tested each time. I think this is the same chart. We just put it on there twice. Uh, I think you're right. OK. Then also, we took seven samples of the particulate. Um, two from the chest on the patient, and one on the abdomen, one on the knee. And then Joe was my assistant since I'm left-handed and he's right-handed. And then we did one on his face mask, one on his chest, and one on his knee that was the closest to me. So overall, we had seven data points that we took. We got a, a huge amount of data from our, from, our, uh, from our study. And session one, again, is with everything turned on. That includes the ionizer. Session two, we turned the ionizer off. Session three, we turned off the high-speed uh, air cleaner. Uh, session four, we turned off the water from the handpiece. And then section, I'm sorry, session five, we turned off the water. Then session six was just the air on the handpiece. So as you can see, those levels really started to climb. The one that we found out was the most significant, of course, was the high-speed air cleaner, the IQ Air. But between here and here, we did a um, we took a cleanup away and put a regular suction tip in there. That's right. So cleanup. I forgot that. The little cleanup device we tell you to use, a lot of people don't like to use it. They say, well, it doesn't work in their heads. They don't have no, any proof of that. It's difficult to use. Well, sometimes it is, but there are ways to get around that. You can trim them a little bit, make them fit over a rubber dam clamp. Um, then there are people that say, well, there's places I can't use a rubber dam. Well, if you've got an anesthetic, you can use it anywhere you want to. Yeah. Um, 
But you see there is a difference. The particulate went up on the patient's chest a significant amount from 340 to 1100. Now that particulate really gets trapped on that cleanup, so that's uh, a significant there. And then he went down in that sample, so <laughs> why that happened, I don't know. But we could probably test some more. So as the results will show here, that with all the controls in place, the dentist, assistant, and patient are still exposed to a little bit of mercury and particulate, much less than what a traditional dentist would, would expose them to. The particulate and the vapor is inhaled and absorbed through the skin, according to these two studies. Now, as you start providing, like I said, a level of protection, and we're going to go over different levels of protection, the word will get out, and you will have patients that will come in the door requesting, demanding that you do this. And if you don't do it, they'll leave. They won't have their work done. And they're very lucrative cases, so you don't want them to leave. So that's, that's one reason it's important as you transition in. You need to make a commitment to do it for every mercury filling. If it's a buckle pit that I can take out in 30 seconds, I put everything on. Okay. You know, this was universal precautions for the AIDS virus, for bacteria. There are no precautions in here for vapor or particulate. We've got exposed skin, we've got a mask that doesn't prevent vapor or particulate. And I know Joe did a study at, um, I mean, Tom Duplinski did a study with a video up at Yale, and they measured with the spectrophotometer while the high dentist was just polishing amalgam, and it went up to 350 within the breathing zone. So just polishing the amalgam on your hygiene side creates an exposure too. So. The first piece of equipment, the most important piece of equipment you need to buy is a high volume evacuator with a mercury filter on it. And these are the two that we know work, that we recommend. The IQ Air has a few more whistles and bells, but I think you run it on high all the time anyway. You want to move as much air as possible. The Den Air Vac is a little simpler machine. Coming out of the ends, the exhaust on both of these is zero. And we tested that before we did our study. We ran these things and saw what was coming out the other end. Both are good units. Then how much, mo how much money you want to spend. So this is like minimal protection uh, that we're showing, for, especially for your team members. And the problem with this protection is I got a lot of exposed skin surface. I've got a... Um, shirt on that I'm probably going to wear all day, or I used to wear all day. So every time I do this, I'm splattering particulate onto this shirt. That particulate that's going to accumulate during the day, it's going to put off more and more vapor during the day. I'm not going to have this on all day long. I'm going to be breathing vapor. And I think in my case, I, my mercury levels went up as I was practicing this way. We're doing a pretty good job protecting the patient. Uh, we've got the rubber dam, we've got the clean air, we've got a nail, uh, nasal air source, we've got a saliva ejector underneath the dam. Y'all have all heard this probably a million times if you've been here to a couple of meetings, that this is what we like to do. Our masks have filter and particulate filters on them. Do two different things. Another way to do this is a positive pressure mask. This is uh, Dr. Call, our, our head of board of directors. Um, he's using pretty good particulate protection. He's using a disposable gown. His face is still showing a little bit. So he's got some exposure there. And I think too, Joe, he's using just a compressor off his compressor. You can run just yeah. uh, a line off your compressor, have a plumber just bring in a line, hook up a nitrous valve to it, and boom, off you go. You don't have to spend the money on the oxygen if you don't want to. And this is a picture of Dr. Warwick starting to add what we're advocating now and what was boarded on, voted on at our board meeting Thursday night, that this is going to be our recommended protocol for the IOMT, is to provide full barrier, barrier protection for doctor, team, and patients. Now, what you use to do it is your choice. We're not telling you you have to put on Matt and I's monkey suits or space suits. 
We just like them. Uh, and you'll notice too, let me add one more thing, Joe. Yeah. Look over the patient's face right there. What Dave does is he takes a regular patient napkin and he grabs it in the middle and he pulls it up like a coffee filter and just cuts it. So that way you've got a little hole and then the hole could go right around that rubber dam. So you don't have to buy a really expensive face drape or anything, you know, too fancy. You can just use whatever you got around the office. As long as it has the, the uh, plastic barrier behind the paper, then it's not going to soak through. And Dave has, this mask is a mercury mask, has mercury filters on it, and he just puts on a little cloth mask over it also, and it's just, his assistant hasn't come in to tie him up yet. He said, make sure you tell me, tell you all that. Um, he can. I think he can wear his loops because he's just using a face shield. So there's all kinds of ways to do it. But you can see their skin's covered, it's um, disposable, the patient's covered, it's disposable. Once you get the... Dave's covered is uh, on the next slide. Oh, I didn't put that in there. Yeah. Dave also covers the instruments behind him. He only has the instruments out he's going to use for removal, so you're not contaminating your instruments as you're getting this out. Because we don't know where this particular is going. We know it's going everywhere. Another thing that Dave uh, studied one time is he took the contaminated expendables that you all throw away after this is done. He mixed it into his general garbage bag and then he left it outside in the sun for a couple hours. Then he poked a little hole in the trash bag and stuck the probe in to measure it and it measured 450, 500 micrograms. So do not mix your, your contaminated disposable materials in with what your hygienist throws away. Because every time your hygienist walks into the, to the lab or the clinic uh, area where you clean up and they open up that trash, they're going to get a, a big breath of mercury every time. So this is Joe and I when we were doing our study. We do, uh, this is actually a patient, real patient. Okay. But uh, Maddie and I wear these Tyvek suits, which everybody's flipped everybody out. But actually, these are very good protection for particulate, but they do breathe, so there's a possibility of vapors coming through those. You don't want to have them on a long day or long. We only wear them when we're taking the mercury out. I find them, they're quick, easy on, easy off. They give me full coverage, and I think they're not as hot as our surgical gowns, and actually, I think they cost about the same amount of money. You don't have to do this, but this doesn't scare the patient. I'm telling you, the patients will go, hey, you didn't put your hood up. Get your hood up. You're not doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and if there is an Ebola virus uh, scare, then it's, sometimes they're harder to get. We had to order an extra case just because of that. So. Now, hopefully, we'll have uh, some questions. We got time for questions? Yeah, please, raise your hand, ask questions. Yeah, run it. Let me bring it. Back. Do you give any oxygen, or just pure oxygen, or are you mix with uh, other? It doesn't really matter either, the oxygen, if you've got it plumbed like with me, as long as it's compressed air, it's in independent breathing supply, it doesn't matter as long as it doesn't have mercury in it. I use pure oxygen, just because it's convenient. Does anybody use their loops? Because that's a real concern. Like, how do you put your loops and your light under that? Well, that you can't. So I just get the mercury out, I take all that off, and I put my loops back on. I have my regular prescription lenses in those. Yeah, you can, you can get the magnifying readers and then there's a mount inside that mask that you can buy for an extra 70 bucks to get but a little bit. You can, you can do the, the nasal, you know, that covers your nose and your face, the comfort fit mask that we have, wear your loops, put a hairnet on. Yeah. So you can. So you yeah, I mean, there's a different ways to do it. If you'd rather just wear your loops, just put a hairnet on. You know, a surgical hood for the, you know, surgeon cap. And then throw that away. I know that we've been talking about mercury a bunch, but what about some of the other procedures that um, are, are special to us, like the uh, cavitation surgeries and that kind of thing? Yeah, Do you, you, as you, at, you know, we're talking about a transition, and so most people are going to start by providing the safe mercury, and you're going to start attracting all of that. Um, you need to take additional courses. Uh, mm -hmm. Phil Mollica's Biological Dental School is excellent. I took that. I mean, it, what happened to me is patients were coming in asking questions. I just nodded my head like I knew what the hell they were talking about, and I didn't know what they were talking about. Right. So I had to go get educated on that. So then you'll have the cavitation patients and eco lesions. You'll have a lot of people on the root canals out. 
which is fine with me. If they want their root canal out, I want their root canal out. I guess what my so question all that, all that will follow. Yeah. Right. But and, that's, and I mean, that's, go ahead. <laughs> I'll let you go. Go <laughs> that's ahead. Okay. No.